my name is Connor Lowe, and I'm a data engineer, Gond analytics engineer. Uh, I work at a company called Do The Space. We are a corporate real estate leasing and asset management company. Um, because our product is an app, the data that we accumulate is one of our most valuable possessions. Um, anything that a landlord might want to know is fair game. Um, from specific, like, from landlord specific questions like uh, which of my tenants are up for renewal to broader market sentiment, our data is really like the bread and butter for us. To give you an idea of how the data teams at BTS are structured, there's three teams. Um, there's the analytics engineering team that I sit on. There's the core data platform that handles ingestion. And there's data science who handles all of our machine learning models. And as for an idea of the presentation, at the top right, you see a timeline. This is gonna be the last 14 months for me because um, that's the, you know, the width, the span of my data vault journey. And there's just a little orange triangle, sorry, diamond, <laughs> that you're gonna see that says here. Uh, you'll watch it move along as we go. And it all started with Asana. Um, which is a productivity tool that you might have heard of, might not have. Uh, you can think of it just like Jira. It is a competitor. Um, my last company was PitchBook, and I had a project manager who wanted to see a dashboard capable of full visibility, like at multiple levels um, of project structure. So at the operational, tactical, strategic, she kind of wanted it all. Um, at the time I was a data engineer, we won't talk about how I built the pipeline, but suffice to say that I got a pipeline going, I've got data landing in Snowflake and um, data was kind of nasty. <laughs> in data engineering, we use the term spaghetti code sometimes to refer to a process that works or maybe doesn't work, but um, is not very interpretable or scalable. And my company at the time had kind of done this with Asana. Um, they'd been using it for two years different departments had different ways of structuring projects in terms of epic stories, tasks. And um, I think Asana is a great, like well-documented API, uh, but on the UI, like user UI side, um, the tasks API endpoint is what you're looking at, but you're not looking at a full payload. You're looking at a single custom field. And so that task, while we're looking at a list of dictionaries, there's only one dictionary in here right now. You can have any number of custom columns, uh, custom fields on a single task. And those can have dictionaries inside of them that don't have to have one value. Like at the bottom right here, you see enumerated options. Uh, conveniently, there's just one in there, but there could be six options, 10. Um, so it was nasty. <laughs> I think I just wanted some organization, any organization, because when I was trying to build the eventual dashboard that the project manager asked for, I was kind of lost. Um, at this point in time, it's ooh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. I really didn't know much about, I knew what a star schema was, a snowflake schema was, I never fully like built out my own dimensional model. And um, I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. So I was reading blogs. And I found Data Vault. Uh, I think it was like some PH data blog, but I read a couple of blogs and I ended up creating to get some organization this very, very nasty thing that does not deserve a title of Data Vault at all. It was basically just a flattened version of the, uh, the tasks API uh, endpoint payload. And so what you see here in this diagram is just a little tiny ERD of, you know, oh, I had hub tasks. And there was, you know, a custom column called tags and assignees and project that, because it could be a part of multiple projects or multiple sections, aye, aye, aye. Um, so in no way, shape or form does this warrant being called the data vault, um, doesn't deserve that title. But at the time it filled its purpose and I was proud of it, but I did realize fairly quickly that it was not a data vault and that it was time to do some learning. Um, a quick side note. So that this is all in Snowflake SQL by hand at this point. Um, and another note, like why isn't this a data vault? Uh, many reasons, but you know, it's a source system data vault. It was built just in the view of Asana. It's not temporal. 
I was rebuilding these tables every day, multiple times a day. Uh, there's no metadata. You don't see hash keys in these these schemas. No low date timestamp. No re uh, record source. And that was just what was wrong with the model. I mean, this doesn't have any architecture or methodology. And so I went off to Finland. <laughs> I just happened to find myself in Prague, um, like a two hour flight from a training that as my vacation was ending, started up in Helsinki uh, by Data Rebels. Uh, I plan on doing the training virtually in the US anyways. So I was like, oh, well, what? when in Rome. And I felt like after my, you know, pseudo failure with 1.0, it worked, wasn't real. Um, I felt like I'd found a kind of a silver bullet. I didn't really understand it yet, but I did not understand why I wasn't hearing more about Data Vault. Wasn't sure if I was just living in a silo or or what the deal was. So I was, was excited to do an in-person class in Helsinki as opposed to virtually in the US. Um, basically, I spent three days in class being that, that kid in the front row asking a bazillion questions. Uh, quite frankly, I was a skeptic trying to make sure that like I was just trying to poke holes in it, trying to see if it held. Um, but I remember Cindy Meyerson was the trainer for that class. And I remember her saying that it was showing a slide and like, ah, Data Vault is fully auditable. And I remember being sold from that point on. Um, I stopped trying so hard to poke holes in it. You know, I still question it, but you know. I think that CDVP2, like the Certified Data Vault Practitioner, Training is really important to do in the beginning because I don't think that it makes you, I don't think that it makes you fully qualified to go home and start an implementation at your company immediately, but it does teach you what not to do. And I feel like at the end of my journey, I'm saying, I feel like what not to do is kind of the name of the game. Um, yeah, but at the time, it was like February of this year, and I thought that I would be able to go home and start an implementation. Uh, so I did go home and pretty much immediately realized that I did not have all the steps of how to implement a data vault at my own company. Um, <clears throat> so I started looking for books to help me on this implementation. I found a couple, but we'll talk about one for now. Uh, the Elephant in the Fridge by John Giles. He's an, an Aussie veteran data modeler. And I mean veteran like the best way. Um, and plus, John has spent part of his career fire like data modeling for national firefighting resources out in Australia. And so it's kind of just a cool book in its own right. But he switches between that experience with the data modeling for firefighting resources and then telling you, uh, here's broadly what you need to do as a first step or a second step. And so it was a really great like business centric. Um, Kind of guide walkthrough. I did that and used him heavily. I will note that, however, John notes or assumes it feels like that you either have A, the organizational influence, or B, the sheer willpower <laughs> to get organizational agreement on core objects. Um, and ask DBAs on here because at the time I didn't know this user group existed. And I was heavily in the forums for my one-off business specific questions that, you know, I don't have John on speed dial. I can't go text him or something. So the forums were an excellent place. Um, but now, you know, at the end of my journey, I can also say that LLMs are a good place for random questions, but also Slack channels. So whether it's DBTs or automate DVs, Slack channel, go for it. It's a great place. Talk with folks that have also gone through what you have. Last note on this slide is that uh, if you haven't heard it in the way I've been talking about it, I was definitely more than daunted at this stage. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but my team is three people and it's a team uh, kind of far away from the action, I think is a good way to put it. And so I was just kind of nervous being the only person pushing for this data vault and um, not really being included in the, the big kid conversations. <laughs> so. Um, I'd gotten my CDVP to Red Elephant in the Fridge and ready to start, but first you kind of have to get engineering on board as well as the business. And so at Pit, uh, not Pitchbook, at VTS, we use ADRs, which are, if you haven't heard of them, are architectural decision records. 
Um, these are like, think of me as a contractor. And this was like my work proposal to the business. It was everything from what, which in my case, um, was just an argument that we had no structure in Snowflake and backing up a little bit. This was in a confluence doc. Um, so, it, you know, a Google doc, if you will. But I was saying we had no structure in Snowflake. Um, it gets reviewed, at least at my company, by at least one staff engineer, uh, the folks who be working on it and their managers. You do these pretty much every time you want to be able to explain a past decision of any import. It does feel a little bit arbitrary at times, but I do ADRs, gosh, it feels like four or five times a month. Um, so that went well. I basically just, the options vetted, I just said, hey, here's star schema, here's snowflake schema, and here's data vault. Um, pros and cons. <clears throat> and everybody was on board. And I was ready to start, and things really started moving at this time because there was like three streams of work that all started moving at once. Uh, one moment. Yeah, excuse me. So the first work stream was CDVP2. Da, 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 da. It was that I started working with DBT Vault, now Automate DB. Um, the second stream was that at that same time, I was also meeting with one of our uh, more senior backend engineers and also meeting with stakeholders. So these three things are happening at the same time. Um, we'll go into the specifics though. So automate DV, I think is a bang up package. Um, it takes almost all the work out of, uh, you know, coding by hand. It makes just the creation so much easier. Uh, but when I was first getting into it, there was two places that really confused me. And I think that's mainly because of the order in which I learned things for data vault. Um, but the first being massive parallel processing, as you see here, I just one in CDVP2, I remember it being drilled into us that, you know, data vault is a massive parallel processing system. And so I did not understand why I had, for example, four source systems, um, all with users tables contributing to a temporary CTE and then being loaded into hub users. But, you know, if you think about it, if you just considered two of these systems, say Salesforce and Marketo, if they loaded exactly at the same time to hub users, what if they have the same ID, like the same hash key? You're going to have a duplicate in your hub and no, no bueno. So um, not a good thing, but it's, you know, necessary and okay. It works out. Second thing was that profiling. <laughs> this one, this one really confused me. And I think once again, because of the order in which I learned things, but also because it was just me at my company, it didn't really have a sounding board. Um, and this was something I ended up asking the forums, but in, in automate DB's docs, there is the TC or TPCH data on that tutorial page. And I'll bet that most of you have gone through it, but for those of you that haven't, there's about, you know, 15 really normalized tables that look like they're from like an OLTP backend. And the very first step that these folks do in their, um, in the tutorial is that they profile it. Uh, so for example, what you see here, part, part supplier and supplier, it makes sense that they should be called inventory. Um, but at the time <laughs> I remember looking at it and like thinking it was you know, sacrilegious, like, oh my gosh, this should be in the business fault. There's transformations before I get to the raw vault. And um, I'll say for those of you doing a new implementation for the first time, this is not something for the business fault because those transformations, they exist in the backend systems themselves. Um, like, you know, table A dot column equals table B dot column. That's not business logic. So this is okay. Profiling is good. So I continued learning about automate DD, um, still mid February, early March. And at the same time was starting up mentor meetings. Um, I really needed a mentor. I think I mentioned this, but if I didn't, I joined VTS in January, had two weeks of PTO <laughs> for Prague and 
the data vault training. And so I had almost no knowledge of the business itself. And I was new to this industry, uh, the corporate real estate industry. And so I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't trick myself or, you know, kid myself about how little I knew. And I realized I would need a mentor. So I basically asked, um, I did a little bit of like slack lurking and figured out who the guy or gal was that everybody asks when they're asking about, you know, tribal knowledge of our data systems. And I sent him in this case, uh, like a 15 minute, I've never met the guy before, but I sent him like a 15 minute reoccurring meeting in Google calendar, just with the message, you know, Hey, potential mentor, um, I'm building this thing. It solves this problem, but I don't have any questions right now, but I know that I will every week. <laughs> so can we have a, this meeting and like an ask me anything style? And, um, you know, it's a great jump off point for conversations, especially with a backend engineer. And, uh, um, he introduced me to more like business stakeholders than I could have found on my own and, you know, a potential friend in this case, he is a friend to me. And so that was definitely necessary for me. I won't say that it's necessary for everybody, but it was a definitely a good win for someone that had just started at this company, um, and all remote too. So like I mentioned, this stake, um, this mentor introduced me to a bunch of, a bunch of our business stakeholders. So I'm working with automate DB, have the mentor meetings weekly. And I, you know, first, before I met with these folks, did my best guesstimate on core objects. Um, I used, basically, I just used existing tribal knowledge from the few meetings I had had. And I also went into the Snowflake database. We use Snowflake. But um, Snowflake database has a schema called account usage in which you can see things like query history. And so I basically used my tribal knowledge with uh, basically a series of histograms on a dashboard, just showing me who was using what database schema table and at what frequency. Conveniently, that includes um, Looker service users. So I really had like the full view here. So I had this list of what I thought were the core objects. Um, things like assets, accounts, tenants, deals, leases, that kind of thing. I said, hey, mentor, I think there's these 10. And um, we talked about that. And then he gave me basically just a list of folks that I could talk to from different departments that might have ideas on whether that was real or not and the nuances of those. And I think I went about this wrong. I had a list of, let's say, 10 people to talk to in the business that were not technical. And I ended up talking to them one by one in a very technical, heavy jargon. <laughs> and that's just, that misses out on two things. Um, that misses out on A, let's say that we had put all of them together in the same room and then said, let's talk about and flesh out the core objects of this business. Let's say that product says, I think a user is somebody that's used, you know, any one of our four products and customer success says, no, it's actually, I mean, we could stop right there. The fact that product can talk and then CS, I'm not doing anything. It's kind of just doing its own. Um, it's working itself out on its own. So that kind of riffing was missed out when I did these conversations one-on-one, -on -one. I would suggest having them all in the same room. It's kind of scary as that is. Um, you know, having all these, you know, VPs and such directors, the people that make the decisions decide together and then little old you. Um, but I also think that this could have been better because, because I had my, um, my own guesstimate of core objects. I was kind of like leading the witness. I would say something like what you see here and like, uh, like, Hey, Andrew, thanks for meeting with me. Um, here's who I am. And I want to get your thoughts on something I'm building. Sure. Connor. Um, and then <laughs> You know, what would you say the core objects are for your business, um, for your department? That is just, that's just not what you want to do. Do not have conversations uh, with your stakeholders like that. Um, this is kind of an echo of a conversation, sorry, a full on presentation that Meg Rush gave last year at the, um, the Data Vault Consortium conference. And uh, her talk was called Ditch the Geek Speak at the Door. You can definitely go online and find that talk, but you know, the basis is that, um, I guess the takeaway is that your business stakeholders 
already view you as a technical guru. Like you, you just are to them. The business cares about business problems and solutions in their own terms, which is why I think folks at Data Vault that have Data Vaults say so often that Data Vault is for the business about the business. Um, so those were happening. I also didn't know where exactly to start. I mean, if I had 10, 10 or so core objects, like what, what do I do first? Um, basically, I ended up kind of arbitrarily choosing some of our existing work. Um, it was called Contribution Score, was just the name of the project. And it doesn't really matter what the name was, but suffice to say that it touched about 80% of our core objects or more. Um, do not choose that. Do not choose something that touches every part of your business for the very first per piece of work that you do with Data Vault. I mean, here I was trying to make a proof of value and um, ended up biting, you know, boiling the ocean as these excellent chat GPT pictures are showing and Drake is, <laughs> Drake is helping out with. Um, it is meant, the Data Vault's meant to be incremental. Um, when you do, as I did and choose a project like contribution score that touches every core object, really, it forces you and the business to come together all in the beginning and get, you know, everything fleshed out. And I think in John Giles book, he would say that you don't choose the bathroom tile before you start building the house. And that's kind of like what this project was like, we really just needed the structure of the house at first. We didn't need the bathroom tile. Um, especially if you're going to hope to keep on working on this project and not have it be deprioritized, don't boil the ocean. And so the result, you know, I'm working with automate DB, the mentor, the business meetings, and, um, I created a source system data vault. I, I knew exactly what it was before I started building and why I shouldn't build it. And I mean, surprisingly, we did come up with most of the right core objects. But at this point in time with iteration 2.0, we really have done zero thinking about the business processes. So all the links were wrong. Like what you see here is really just like a walk of, it looks almost exactly like my app backend. And um, I mean, this is bad because without reflecting the actual business processes with your links, you're gonna get things like uh, what we call orphan records. Um, like imagine joining all these together having records result that do not exist in the source system. So side note, that's why it's so important to test as you're building your data vault. Um, but you know, with the source system data vault like this in iteration 2.0, you really have not fixed any problems. If anything, you might've made things worse because you have yet another system that you need to match up with your existing systems. So by March, by March, 2023, I'd say that was busted. Uh, iteration 2.0 was dead and the business did not like my DB and my DB was just kicking me. <laughs> um, good conversations, but no consensus on business objects. Uh, so to recap, you know, even after all my training, reading and knowing what a source system data vault was, uh, I still ended up making one. Um, I do think that's because I tried to boil the ocean and in the end, it was really still just me trying to interpret how the business operated. I met with lots of folks and asked questions, but I didn't let them decide together what the you know what this should look like. It was them telling me and then me deciding. Not the right way to go about it, in my opinion. So yeah, like we said earlier, data vaults meant to be incremental. So start with something small. And even worse, and I specifically didn't mention it until now, but contribution score not only touched about 80% of our core objects, but it was also a time sensitive need. I think that gal gave me about two months to get this. And so at week six, I was like, well, this isn't going to work out with data vault. So I might as well freeze that for now and get her, her information in the old fashioned ad hoc fact table that really isn't a fact table DBT way. And I, so I decided to double down, you know, I finished, I finished off by May, I'd finished off the stakeholder task contribution score in a way that was not data vault. 
And I took a step back and decided that, you know, I still felt like data vault was the right way to do things. Um, so I went out to the, call it the worldwide data vault consortium. We'll call it data vault conference for now. Um, so if you've been to DBT coalesce that conference, uh, this is entirely different. Like the veterans are here at this one. And, uh, since it's capped at about 300 people and it's in Stowe, Vermont, a very tiny ski town, um, it's a really tight knit community feel. It was really cool to meet some folks interested in data vault like I was. And, uh, it's definitely more international than DBT in some ways it felt like at least. Um, but I went and it was an excellent opportunity to iron out all the small questions that I've been wondering. Um, my iterations of data vault up to this point hadn't really got to the, the end, you know, we hadn't got to the getting data out of the vault. So I had a series of questions and, you know, things like, uh, I've got, I've got core objects that have a zero to many relationship with each other. How am I going to avoid a left join here? And cause I know that most folks use only inner joins to get that speed boost and avoid scanning whole tables and joins and the many joins in data vault there are. So things like that. And also just seeing how others had implemented their own data vaults. Um, it was very cool meeting with other folks who were at like the same, the same stage as I was. We could just kind of hash things out real time. So data vault conference was great. Um, and so we wanted to start up iteration 2.1. I decided that based on how long it was taking just me to get this done, I decided that it was probably time to start building a plan to train my teammates. Um, I'd learned my lesson from 2.0 and wanted to start smaller and go slower. Uh, luckily I'd learned a lot from trying so hard and I mean, ultimately failing in iteration 2.0, but I uh, was able to create my own training materials for these two folks. And I mean, why bother training them at all? I think it was really because I didn't want to be a bottleneck for the company. I didn't want to contribute to the issue of tribal knowledge. Um, I wanted this work to be more like, like a backpack, if you will, um, or my predecessor could just, you know, put it on and go. And, you know, of course I wanted to scale and create more value faster. Um, it would need a couple things first. So a little background, I, like I had two potential teammates who could help me on this. Um, not to say that they like had to, but there was no budget for them to get CDBP2 training. Um, I ended up held, like holding three trainings that I think um, in hindsight, I tried to cover too much. Uh, but these three trainings were A, like going over the data vault model and its relevance to the company. Uh, B, local development, and like a group walkthrough of a small repo build, like from scratch, and the methodology and ways of working. And going into those, um, that first training, I, you know, I had these teammates, they've been with the company a while and seem intent in their existing workflow. So I would say that this first training was more like, and mind you, I like, I had the ADR approval and everything, but still, I felt like I needed to convince my teammates that this is worth their time. Like they had plenty of other work to do. And um, VTS has dozens of source systems. So I really tried to drive home the point that the state of vault would be like, like building blocks on top of which we could build more concise analytics and reduce iteration time with stakeholders. So like, for example, the diagram you see here is something I show them just to illustrate. Uh, today on the left, we have, you know, four tables from four systems turning into four tables from four systems in Snowflake. Not that fun. Um, and on the right is like the after state with using data vault where you have four in one out as opposed to four out. Um, and that went, that went just fine. I mean, we did such a high level. There was nothing really to get wrong at that point in all honesty. Um, and a quick segue before we go into the second training, but, uh, CI, I think CI was it may have taken us a minute there and I'll talk about why, but I think it was ultimately a win in this kind of sea of <laughs> failures and iterations. But, you know, the ultimate goal was, you know, I had these teammates trying to like convince them to join this, this new project. And I wanted CI to like, just run fast, you know, PR happens historically in our old project, you know, you'd be sitting there for 40 minutes doing something else, of course, but you know, why wait 40 minutes for one run 
just to realize at the very last step that you didn't have a required test. <clears throat> um, so some issues that came up were uh, making changes to a PR branch in CI, like in having the CI job persist its changes. Um, Self-hosted runners were kind of a pain for a moment there. And I think I spent like a sprint and a half, so maybe three or four weeks just building what you see on the right. Um, and I removed the run step commands, but this is like the actual outline of like, ah, build and push an image and then use that image to do everything in parallel. And it may have taken three or four weeks, but I mean, once we were done, we had like under five minute runs that kept your entire DBT project up to date in terms of YAML. And it would create with a package called DBT to Looker, it would create LookML views and explorers for every um, SQL file in a specified folder. So it did definitely make the process smoother of DBT. Uh, previously, we had to like make a PR, have it merge, run and prod, and then create a Looker PR. But this was so much more streamlined. So CI, good. <laughs> uh, but training two, we were doing local development and group walkthrough. Yeah, probably heard it in the CI talk, but we use containers. Um, unfortunately for my teammates, I came from a place of working with containers before I ever started virtual environments. Oops. Uh, so naturally, that's how the development process looked for Data Vault in this repository of mine. It was a bit of a hurdle for my teammates and you know, definitely an unnecessary one in hindsight. Um, but during the training, uh, we went through as a group, just this demo branch I built and tagged and did what you see here. We went from two systems, each with the user's table, going from raw stage to hash stage to the raw vault, and then creating a, like a business vault, same as link for user. And I would say that once we got past the containers bit, things went fine but I feel like the containers were unnecessary. They could have just existed in CI. Um, so we've done the basic high level overview. We, you know, we did our own walkthrough together, but this third training actually got cut short because I realized that, you know, talking at my teammates every other week just wasn't gonna get us where we needed to be when we needed to be there. But we were gonna go over like our, um, our ways of working, like what a sprint should look like for us, what the whole cycle should look like, uh, the roles and the responsibility of those roles. Um, but, you know, reflecting on those trainings, you really don't need everyone to know everything. Like it really could have, I mean, gosh, for those of you that have worked with Automate DB, you know that creating a hub is anywhere from like, seven to 20 lines of code. It's really not a lot. So I think that probably what should have happened is I should have just been delegating after doing some high level training, as opposed to trying to get everyone to know everything. Um, definitely minimize the amount of material. I should not have tried to teach my, uh, well, I shouldn't have tried to take them away from virtual environments. Nothing wrong with teaching them containers, but it was a, because of the way I set up that repo, it was a, a like a bottleneck. And had I really learned my lesson with iteration 2.0, um, I felt like I thought I'd learned my lesson of starting small, but definitely start small. Like I cannot emphasize enough that it's okay to not have it perfect, uh, your CI or, you know, any aspect of this, just get that win, show value. Um, so the trainings were done. And I started delegating work because I was like, oh, my teammates should just get their hands dirty. It's time to start. And I can review their PRs. But I think that this is the start of a sequence of hiccups that each required some data vault rework. Uh, so please, like as we're going through the next six or so iterations slash slides, just imagine like the Benny Hill theme song playing in the background while my teammates and I run around chaotically. Um, and in this instance, I've been going back and forth with some folks on the forums and about that bit I mentioned earlier with uh, always using inner joins to get data out of the vault. And one of the moderators pointed out 
that in one of my diagrams, I had some auto incrementing integer IDs from my, uh, my apps back end as the business keys <laughs> and that they probably weren't the business keys I was looking for, um, uh, you know, enter Obi-Wan or, you know, Ben meme anyways. Uh, the business keys are the unique values used to identify a business entity, and they're most likely not the primary keys of your backend tables. Uh, so in my situation, I had assets, not the integer primary key. It is more likely the building name uh, plus the floor number plus the space. Like together, those things are an asset. Not, you know, one plus two plus three concatenated. So that was some rework. Um, and you know, with, with all these iterations, I was like, ah, it's probably time to read another book. So I read the Data Vault Guru, and I think it was a perfect complement to the elephant in the fridge. Like the business-centric elephant in the fridge combined with, I think Patrick Kiva's book was more technical and had a lot more of the actual code that you would use to really do every part of the Data Vault. And so together they were great. I wish I'd read it sooner. And, um, but from reading this book, I realized that oh, I don't have any default treatments as Patrick calls them on my business keys, which I just refactored. Um, but you know, collision codes, casting all business keys as text and sending them to lowercase, uh, needed another iteration. It's iteration 2.4. I felt like we'd found something cool. Um, we used SQL DBM just for the first bit here, but I think you can use a couple of different IDEs. And essentially what's happening here is that we had some semblance of a vault and we had implemented a package in DBT called DBT constraints, not to be confused with DBT 1.5's contracts on models, because I know that those come with constraints as well, but this package is built by Snowflake and it's the same thing as dbt 1.5 contracts except for you don't have to have contracts enabled so it's great if you want to if you still want to have those constraints um, like the query optimizer can consider the primary key unique key foreign key um, during query rewrite if it's set to rely but you don't have to have the data type of everything in your yaml and that's good it allows you to have basically tests and then most tools that have reverse engineering can just take the test that you have defined and build this like this. I think I clicked just that button right there. Boom. It was an awesome way to visually show really anyone that wanted to know about the data vault we were building. Um, just what was what I think this is way more telling than, uh, than me trying to describe it by just words alone. So definitely use visuals. So we learned from 2.4. Oh, in 2.5 through 2.8, um, the Benny Hill theme song is still playing, but the headache that is the assets hub. Um, as a corporate real estate and you know asset management app, assets are like everything to us. And um, unfortunately, we have well, fortunately, we have four products, but unfortunately, each of these four products refers to some aspect of an asset, but in different ways. Um, like one system calls a physical building a property, but it's really a, a user specific view of a property. And um, another calls them buildings, which is truly like a physical building is a building. But all this, all this mismatch, um, the business had never really taken the time to come to terms with what they wanted to see and what the relationships were between these, these four asset type things but you know oops <laughs> life happens you know one day everybody this is recently but um uh, back in september there was a day where i got in and like a quarter or more of engineering folks were just gone and um obviously that comes with some serious organizational restructuring and data vault was deprioritized um so i will say that if i could go back um Real experience is a must. I think I, I read reading books was a great way to get to know everything about Data Vault, but not actually how to do it. Uh, kind of the way, kind of like in fishing, where you know you could read all the books in the world on fishing, but you'd never really know the struggle of you and the fish or catching the fish. 
so in the same way, you know, what it's like to implement a data vault. Uh, I would recommend if you don't have like business buy-in and you're like, I want to create a data vault, but I, I just can't get the work for it. I mean, you could create a personal Git repository, then either use Kaggle data or a Python package like Faker to make your own data and then create your own data vault. And the more real you treat it, the better, because you'll come across the same things, uh, the same problems that you would in the business, and you'll be all the better for it. So definitely do your own experience with books and forums and Slack, whatever. Oh, and secondly, consider hiring help. I think it's like just this morning, I was thinking about it this way. Imagine you're on a hike and it's a pretty steep hike and you don't really need hiking poles. So you can get through it, you trip a lot. <laughs> um, it's kind of like that. Like there's plenty of qualified groups um, that can train you and do kickstart services. But you know, for me, I was on a hike without poles. I had no help. Um, I got through the hike for the most part, but I tripped a lot. But you know, why why not use a hiking pole? Like why not hire some consultants and um, basically just trip less? <laughs> you know, you're still going to get through it either way. But wouldn't you like to trip less? It definitely feels in the beginning like oh, I can do that. And you can, but just note that those hiccups will most likely happen. So today, you know, after this serious internal restructuring, there is definitely still a need to create some version of the truth. And um, I do still think that Data Vault is the right answer. But for the meantime, we're just settling on a dimensional snowflake schema. And I kind of just view this as another iteration in our journey of 51st Data Vaults. And so thanks for listening. I think I need to hand it back over to Neil.